Um, I always set aside your articles or bookmark them. That way I can spend some quality time reading them. They're, they're very insightful. So uh, everybody listening to this, it's a real treat and a real pleasure to have you on the show today. Um, Charles, let's, let's start off with um, some of the bigger things that uh, are going to play out over the next three to six months in the U.S. economy. We have the Fed hiking rates. Um, we have a new president. We have D.C. probably more pol polarized than ever. We have a debt ceiling that, that maxed out on the 15th. Um, I, I've, I've read your work for years now, and you've talked about the unsustainability of our system. Is, is perhaps the Trump presidency the, uh, the time that this unsustainability will, pro will finally reveal itself uh, in the markets and the economy? Well, Daniel, I think that's an excellent question, and it's um, a question I think a lot of uh, people are asking, um, both from a conspiratorial view that um, <laughs> some feel that Donald Trump might be uh, being set up to be the fall guy for the, um, the next Great Depression. <laughs> um, other people feel that he's fumbling the situation and will, um, will cause the Great Depression through his policies. Um, I, I, I don't think that either of those positions is, is really getting to the heart of what we're dealing with here which is um, these deep structural changes in the U.S. economy and the global economy. And our reaction to those uh, structural changes has been inadequate. And, and uh, my, my proposition is the system as we now have it, whatever you want to call it, the status quo, um, the state cartel version of capitalism we have, um, it's, it's not... Um, capable of responding positively to the kind of challenges we have because it's set up and it's optimized for the economy of 1946 through like 1964. In other words, the post-war uh, version of capitalism when government intervention seemed like a positive thing and um, and the Fed kind of was in the background and, and pulling a few strings, but every the, the market dominated and the, the whole populace seemed to benefit from the um, prosperity of those decades. You know, when, when people think about what uh, you know Trump ran on bringing jobs back, do you think this is even something that could have happened? And do you think that uh, Trump truly believed that he could bring jobs back? Well, that's um, it's funny. That's that's a great question because it it, it talks it, it divides two uh, important concepts. One is what's actually possible in the real economy and and what do we believe that we can manage and i think that's it's really a great question because it's not just what trump believes it's but it's what the um everyone else in the establishment believes and it's it's what the american public believes right and are we drifting away from reality uh and, and perhaps all those players are drifting away from reality uh and i would say yeah i think that we're all uh many of us are are caught up in this view that we can go back to the good old days and so to answer your question i think we need to introduce the topic of the fourth industrial revolution and this is not my term this is a term i've borrowed from other really smart people who see that the digital revolution which includes the internet, uh, mobile uh, telephony, um, just a, crypto currencies, everything that's um, coming of age in in this time frame. It's digital. This this kind of the equivalent of the of of an industrial revolution, like say in 1840 when steam engines and locomotives and all that developed, or say in the late 19th century when. Um, uh, the, the the technologies of, of uh, recording sound and, and uh, telephones and all that were developed, and so we're we're these forces are beyond the reach of of any government regulation. Like you can't really say, well, we're going to create jobs by fiat in this industry, right? It, it doesn't work like that. So the the um, the problem is that robotics and AI uh, software. Um, 
uh, in in Mark Andreessen's famous phrase, are eating the world. <laughs> in other words, they they are replacing low end, low skill labor, and so the jobs that are um, being created require a lot higher level of of not just education. That's the cliche. Everyone says, well, let's just get more education. No, it requires a whole um, higher level of of soft skills. In other words, you can't just teach somebody to code and then drop them into the economy and expect them to to prosper. They actually need a bunch of soft skills. They need to co- be able to collaborate effectively. They need to be able to communicate effectively. These are skills that um, are more difficult to teach than just some technical skill. And so um, we have this huge mismatch between the population um, that we have at a certain level of skill sets and then the the needs of the fourth industrial revolution economy or what I call the emerging economy. Those are those are different. And so we're going to have a massive realignment where a lot of people are saying, I can't find a job, but um, it's because they're not qualified for the work that's out there. So in this transition, what is the best response for the individual that is listening to this show? Uh, let's call it, let's maybe perhaps address the two larger generations, two largest generations, the millennials and the baby boomers, each of them in a totally different scenario here. What is their individual sol- solution? What is their individual navigator in this transition? <clears throat> well, that's a great question. Um, I wrote a book uh, a year or two ago called Get a Job, Build a Real Career, and Defy a Bewildering Economy. And the bewildering economy part is, you know, part of our economy is the old system, right? A bunch of cartels like Big Pharma or the national defense industries or, to me, higher education, the whole college university structure is like a cartel, right? They they set the, they have price setting, they're, um, they have no competition, uh, really, um, and so we have this old part of the economy that's that's basically uh, controlled or managed by the the central government, and then we have the new economy, you know, the Google and the um, you know the Apple and um, Netflix and um, uh, hundreds of other companies uh, that are disrupting at the edges, at least some of this uh, the existing old style cartel state. Um, economy. So it is bewildering because there are people that go to work for the government and and uh, if you have a nice secure government job then you're looking out at the the economy going, "Well, what's the problem here? I've got a great um, you know, great benefits package. I'm going to retire with a uh, a guaranteed pension." And the point of view from that kind of uh, inside the fiefdom, if you will, looking out over the battlements at the at the economy that um, the non-government sector has to struggle with, then um, they, they they don't get it, and so um, that the bewildering part. So the the answer is you. We're all going to have to embrace technologies and and learn to use them, and and so that skill set is what is still valuable. So for instance. Um, I, some of my contacts are in the oil services industry. They, they are making pipe fittings and um, equipment for the oil uh, and gas sector. And so they, they, they are using um, high-tech tools, right? And so they need um, people, employees, who know how to use these tools. And so I think uh, that's a that's a hands-on example, but of course there's lots of digital examples of that. That that um, the machines can't do everything, and humans are uh, more adept at certain things, and um, we have to exploit those as individuals. So does the transition have to have some at some point some sort of implosion of the old system, or can the new system with digital technology and innovation? Um, sort of um, outpace government uh, inefficiencies and un- uh, in the unsustainable uh, trajectory of, of what the government has done to our economy. Can can this tsunami of debt and fraud be overwhelmed by a larger tsunami of technology and innovation? <clears throat> well, that's a fascinating uh, 
topic because um, we see we see the uh, the forces you're describing uh, winning and losing depending on the sector. Uh, um, say, for instance, within um, the uh, you know cab industry or the uh, car share industry, uh, Uber and and um, all these these uh, startups, they're certainly disrupting the um, the old model. But when it comes to the the really big systems, national defense, you know, the, the Pentagon spending, healthcare, which is almost twenty percent of our economy, higher education, you know, trillion plus student loan debt, these huge, uh, you know, uh, cartels, they have so much political power that they are um, going to fend off and fight to the death any any actual disruption. So um, it's going to—I don't—I don't see any path forward because they're not going to relinquish their power, wealth, and income. It's just why should I? You know, I mean, we, we've got this thing wired, and they can buy the influence in in Washington to protect themselves. <clears throat> and so, I think it's going to have to be the internal contradictions in this old decaying system have to. Um, cause it to implode, and only then will we be able to really um, uh, en enable the digital revolution to, to hit, like higher education, <clears throat> uh, health care, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, the national defense industries. Uh, Charles, I want to ask you about the cryptocurrencies. If you thought Bitcoin uh, perhaps was paving the way, it would be ultimately a sacrificial land, maybe like the AOL or Yahoo but really just paving the way for the real digital currency that's going to lead the way to the to the future. Yes, Daniel, I, I think um, I think you've pegged it uh, perfectly, and I think a lot of people in the cryptocurrency space um, have reached the same conclusion that you have um, that the problems um, that Bitcoin is experiencing, which um, uh, for those people who aren't that um, experienced about the uh, the cryptocurrencies, uh, Bitcoin's basic structure uh, limits the number of transactions that can occur, and as uh, it's become more popular and more widely used, then it's straining the the boundaries of the of the Bitcoin protocols, and so. Um, I think the um, the other uh, interesting thing, and, and I'm an amateur in this system. I don't claim any expertise. I'm just like everybody else, um, constantly reading about it, trying to educate myself about a very fast-moving um, industry. The blockchain technology that underpins Bitcoin has much broader uses, and so that this is why um, Ethereum, for example, or Dash, these other uh, cryptocurrencies are are more than just a currency. They're actually like an entire business platform. And so it's pretty easy, um, even for an amateur like myself, to look ahead and go, gosh, well, that that's the future, right, is, is – um, is a, a cryptocurrency, the, the super cryptocurrency, or Bitcoin 2, or whatever we'll call it, will integrate into a whole um, business platform, and that will um, enable uh, um, not only faster transactions, but different kinds of tra transactions, such as the smart contracts that um, Ethereum is trying to uh, you know, implement. Well, certainly having like a known promoter and and founder, uh, I've always thought, you know, when I talked with, uh, you know, baby boomers or, or even Gen Xers, I mean, uh, if, if, if it was a Microsoft digital currency or Amazon digital currency or Apple or whatever, they would adopt it in a second. But because it's so mysterious and so on the outskirts, um, you know, it's it's very difficult for many people to uh, to to even give it a try. Right, right. And um, the the uh, other thing about Bitcoin is, yeah, the, those uh, those flaws you mentioned are are um, part of its um, appeal. Actually, is that it's uh, decentralized and it's um, it's under the control of of these Bitcoin miners. 
who are uh, this, uh, uh, basically it's a decentralized thing that some people are have come to dominate that process. So uh, it, it may be that we um, that we see the cryptocurrencies subdivide out um, to serve a variety of needs. In other words, Bitcoin may survive. If the um, if it doesn't hard fork, in other words, split into two camps, it, it can remain slow and awkward, but it still may have a store of value because there's only um, 21 million Bitcoin can be um, created, and I think we're up to about 17 and a half million now, and so it may it may serve a role as sort of a a cryptocurrency that you can count on. Um, to hold its value because it um, has a scarcity value, while the other newer currencies will be more the ones you use for your actual business transactions. And um, you mentioned the big technology companies, and they just um, a couple of weeks ago they announced uh, a number of these. I think it was Google and Microsoft uh, announced uh, collaboration on the Ethereum platform. Oh, so they've sort of picked Ethereum as the most likely winner here, and of course Ethereum quickly went from like ten dollars per uh, token to thirty or something. So uh, it's 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 early days though, and um, somebody uh, there could be a currency that comes out of nowhere, and if it if it functions uh, without the limitations of of all the other currencies, um, it could be the winner. And I know some some of my software contacts that know a lot more about it than I do, um, they favor Dash. And, and I can't really, I'm not an expert, so I can't really tell you why Dash is better than, than Ethereum, but I think I can say that each of these cryptocurrencies may serve a slightly different audience and needs. And so it may be that we have um, a half dozen uh, major cryptocurrencies, each serving a slightly different uh, need. And, and that would be, fine as long as we can convert easily between them and our fiat currencies that may be the wave of the future sure and the dollar is to a certain extent already a digital currency would you agree with that yeah, absolutely i mean i what's the total money supply and then how much is in cash i think total cash is a trillion uh globally and um, the money supply of dollars is is uh, an order of magnitude above that. So yeah, that's interesting. You know, because there's so much resistance uh, to some of these new innovative ideas, but really people don't realize they're sitting on digital currency anyway already. Uh, when it comes to the banks and the, uh, the both the central banks and the the larger banks like J.P. Morgan. Um, do you think that they will um, pr pretty much reject this for as long as they can, or do you think they'll, um, you know, in the near term, probably ad adopt the digital currencies because they see that it is, it is a, the way of the future, especially with the millennials? Yeah, I think I think you're right, and um, at least anecdotally. Now, I, I I I don't know if this is actually true, but there was news uh, some time ago that Goldman Sachs had supposedly pulled some patent applications on their own uh, version of the blockchain. Uh, I think the smart money uh, globally is um, realizing that, that the banking industry is going to be disrupted, at least at the margins, um, by, by the cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. So it, it's, yeah, it's either embrace, embrace that or die. Um, and the question is, what can the banks do to generate um, transactional revenue? Because that's the beauty of the cryptocurrencies is, um, like I myself, uh, I paid some um, some uh, people that were translating and editing uh, my book um, in South America. I paid them with Bitcoin, and the transaction costs are negligible compared to going through the banking system where you've got a $35 fee for this and then, you know, another fee for that. And um, and so there, I don't think, I think the banks are going to lose a lot of transactional um, income and they're, I'm not quite sure what they're going to do to uh, compensate for that because the, the whole idea of the blockchain and cryptocurrencies is it lowers those transactional costs tremendously. 
Uh, last, last question for you, sir. On uh, any time we talk about the economy or cryptocurrencies, um, investments come come up. You know, people with their with a four hundred one k right now. Perhaps the company gives them a match. Uh, do you have um, any suggestions uh, or non licensed advice? So everybody knows that you're not a financial advisor, giving them individual advice, but. Do you have any uh, broad suggestions for people who uh, are looking to either uh, perhaps um, change their investing uh, that they have currently or uh, make new investments uh, that, that would prosper in the new economy? Yeah, I think, I think that's an excellent question, um, Daniel, and that um, I, I, I would answer it like this. I would frame it um, in this fashion. Um, we all know that assets, uh, classes like stocks, bonds, and real estate have all um, been uh, tremendously under the influence of these central bank policies of quantitative easing and uh, purchase direct purchases of assets and uh, lowering interest rates to near zero. And so that, um, if you believe that that's sustainable forever and ever, then um, you can kind of stay in those uh uh, bubbly assets, um, but if if you uh, foresee the potential that that's that's not a trend that's sustainable forever and ever, then you're going to start looking at asset classes as what's exposed to a reset, what's exposed to a um, a uh, price discovery when the central banks either withdraw this kind of support or it, it, it reaches the point of diminishing returns where uh, the market's no longer responding to this kind of um, stimulus. Um, and that reset, of course, would probably mean a repricing downwards because we're, 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 a lot of these assets are priced to perfection. And so let's say, for instance, inflation kicks up, not to 2%, but to 5 or 10%, which is now considered impossible. Well, that's going to have a dramatically negative impact on stocks, bonds, and real estate, all these um, assets that are near their price to perfection. So I would say um, I personally, and this is not advice, just what my strategy is, I'm looking around for uh, passive um, investments that are have lower exposure to this, this kind of um, repricing or re resetting of valuations once the central banks either withdraw stimulus or it no longer works. And so you go, well, what is that? And you go, well, that's, that's, that's a question everybody has to answer for themselves. But um, obviously if you own an orchard and it produces X amount of fruit and it has a certain market value, then you may not be able to control the value of that underlying land, right? It could bubble up or it could crash. But you're still going to have a product that you can sell in the market that, that there's a need for that. So that's kind of my approach. You know, buy the income stream and don't worry about the asset. Uh, if, you're, if you're relying on the asset price for your wealth, uh, that's, that's an iffy proposition. But if, you're, um, if you own an income stream that, that's in demand, then um, you, you don't really care so much about uh, what the valuation set by the market is at any one moment. It's a great point. Great advice.